new stream, I think. Uh, we shall review what we did last week so we don't just sit without doing anything. Inshallah, and then once they tell us to start, then we will uh, go ahead and start where we left off from last time. Alhamdulillah, uh, Muhammadan صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين وتابعيهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد إن شاء الله as it was advertised we are going to do the book by uh, or uh, collected from the words of the Imam Ibn Al-Qayyim عليه رحمة الله that book is titled طب uh, القلوب or medicine for the heart uh, however last week we started doing uh, the short advice, it's a small treatise uh, by Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and we said we're going to do that first until you know more people will hear about this uh, Thursday lecture so that people when they start with us they will start from the beginning and they will not miss any of the series inshallah that is going to uh, that we're going to start so this uh, booklet titled al wasiya al sura or the short legacy, the short advice by Ibn Taymiyyah it's basically a question that was asked to him by one of the scholars, uh, Abu al-Qasim al-Maghribi. And uh, this question and answer, they appear in volume 10 of the uh, collection of the Fatawa, Majmu'a Fatawa, Ibn Taymiyyah alayhi rahmatullah and uh, the Shaykh Abu al-Qasim al-Maghribi he asked the questions that are very important and the scholars say that part of uh, seeking knowledge or the seeking knowledge being done in a good way is to ask good questions husn al-su'al because sometimes people Because sometimes people, they will um, ask questions that are not suitable. The questions that are not suitable. <coughs> and sometimes these questions, uh, they might be beneficial, but they are of little benefit. Very little benefit. So Abu al-Qasim al-Maghribi, he asked uh, Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah he asked him to give him a general advice about his deen and about his dunya and then he asked him to guide him to a book uh, that he should study regarding the science called terminology of hadith that branch of the legal knowledge or the Islamic knowledge titled Terminology of Hadith and also he asked for a book in the rest of the branches of the legal knowledge and he asked for uh, guiding him to the best virtuous good deed after performing the compulsory uh, deeds and also he asked him to advise him regarding the best of means for seeking a living and all of that he wanted uh, to be in short. So the Shaykh said, as for the general advice, uh, it's the same advice as in the Book of Allah. We have counseled you and those who were before you, or we counseled those who were before you, and you yourselves, that you should have piety. Uh, taqwa of Allah, you should be God-fearing. And then he mentioned that this advice uh, in the Quran uh, we find Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam giving a very similar advice, but with more uh, detail, and that is the advice that he gave to Mu'ad ibn Jabal radiyallahu anhu. So Shaykh al-Islam started by uh, telling us about Mu'ad, uh, about the status that Mu'ad had with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He mentioned the different narrations about him, that he is 
the most knowledgeable uh, in terms of halal and haram, that is Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to have him ride behind him on the same riding animal. He was very close to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said about him that he will be on the day of judgment coming and he is a step ahead of the scholars. Mu'ad radiallahu anhu, he will be leading the scholars. Then he mentioned that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, the well-known companion of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, used to say about Mu'ad, he used to describe him radiallahu anhu with the same descriptions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given or has said about Ibrahim. In Ibrahim kana ummatan, he was a nation of, of, on his own. Qanitan uh, lillahi hanifan, he was completely devoted to Allah and he was hanif upon tawheed, drifting away from shirk, started, you know, like, inshallah. And he was not of the mushrikeen. So Abdullah bin Mas'ud used to say about Mu'ad that he is like that, radiallahu anhu. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once uh, also told Mu'ad and he made an oath saying, by Allah, I love you. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying to Mu'ad, by Allah, I love you. Then he mentioned to him the dua or the dhikr that we say after salah, Allahumma a'inni ala dhikrik wa shukrik wa husni ibadik. He advised him since he loves him, he advised him not to miss saying this dua or this dhikr after salah. Allahumma a'inni wa Allah help me ala dhikrik to remember you wa shukrik and to thank you wa husni ibadatik and to worship you in a good manner. So after clarifying the status of Mu'ad, his excellence radiallahu anhu, he said that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he gave him this advice. And that is, fear Allah wherever you are and follow up an evil deed with a good one and you will erase it. Uh, so uh, that was the art that we did uh, last week. And the Shaykh basically said that if one will have piety, will have taqwa of Allah wherever he is. And if uh, one will follow up the evil deeds that one commits, he will follow them up with good deeds, then those good deeds will erase the evil ones. And in this way, Shaykh al-Islam said that uh, by this way, one will be fulfilling the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, will be fulfilling the rights of Allah subhanahu uh, wa ta'ala. Uh, he said that the evil deeds can be washed away by uh, different means and uh, those uh, different uh, means they could be for instance by a tawbah repentance secondly by istighfar even without tawbah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may forgive the uh, person. The third thing that one can do to expiate or to wash away for his sins or her sins is to uh, apply the set kafarat. The set means of expiations. Uh, this is uh, was mentioned like the kafara, for instance, of breaking the fast in Ramadan. Right? by uh, setting a slave uh, free or by uh, fasting uh, three, uh, fasting two consecutive uh, months. Uh, some of the kafarat are like this, for instance, for fasting or for uh, abdihar also. There are three ways that are set, uh, preset by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means of expiation for violation of the um, the uh, sacredness of the month of Ramadan, or making an oath, which is called uh, al dihar uh, when someone says not necessarily an oath, but saying to his wife, "You are like my mom." Uh, يعني, um, like the uh, he mentioned as an example, also the kafarat that are set 
for uh, the Hajj time, if you uh, break one of the rules of the Haram, right? Like, uh, for instance, slaughtering uh, a sheep and the likes of this. There are things that are set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The kafara of the oaf, for instance, feeding uh, 10 needy people uh, or clothing them or setting a slave free. And if you cannot do any of these, then after that, if you cannot do any of these three, then you will fast three days. That is the kafara of the uh, ayman when you make an off and then you break that off. So there are preset kafarat. Right? There are kafarat that are general. Like generally the good deeds that would erase the evil ones, like praying the five daily prayers and praying the Jum'ah, fasting from Ramadan to the next Ramadan and uh, the recommended fast. These are things that are legislated for us to wash away uh, our sins. And the Shaykh said that knowing uh, these uh, excellences of the good deeds is a very important subject. And the scholars, they've offered books regarding that called Fadail al-A'mal or the excellences of the uh, good deeds. Uh, and then he said that one should be really uh, careful and diligent to know these things that will wash away the sins. That is because uh, during these times, the times that are uh, resembling the times of Jahiliyyah or the times of Fatarat, the times when uh, there are no uh, prophets that are sent, meaning that the times of ignorance, there is not much information, there is not much knowledge that is widespread between the people, uh, those times then you need to even do more or spend extra effort to learn these uh, good deeds so that you can wash away uh, the sins. Then he mentioned that the Ummah will fall into the same uh, that the two nations before us, the Jews and the Christians, they have fallen into. The Muslim Ummah will follow their ways and will fall will fall into the same things that they have fallen into. And the best way to wash away and to expiate for the sins is to know the good deeds that will wipe, that will wash away uh, the sins. The last thing that he mentioned that will uh, also wash away the sins, although this is something that you do not have the choice of doing, but these things they do wash away the sins, and these are al-masaib al mukaffira the calamities, the hardships that one goes through, these things, they also expiate and wash away uh, the sins. So then, fear Allah wherever you are, and follow up an evil deed with a good one, and you will erase it. And then, khaliq al-nasa bi khuluq hasan Deal with the people with good manners. Have good behavior when you are dealing with others. So the Shaykh uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, he said that when the right of Allah was fulfilled by uh, having taqwa, piety, and also by washing away the sins by doing good deeds, now he turned to advising Rasulullah uh, advised Mu'ad now to fix up also now the part that deals with uh, the fellow human beings and nas so he ordered him to deal with the people with good manners this is the right of the people the sheikh said that jima'ul khuluq al hasani ma'al nas he would give now a connective word a collective description of how to be good with people, how to have good manners, how to have good behaviors, with, or good behavior with people. What does that mean? He says, 
بالسلام والإكرام والدعاء له والاستغفار والثناء عليه والزيارة له Good manners with people. It means that you should join the ties with those who cut you off. Connect with those who chose to not connect with you, chose to cut off the relationship with you. Those who chose to cut off the relationship with you, you choose to connect with them. He said, how? By giving them a salam greetings of peace and by al-ikram by honoring them and a dua by making dua for them and by al-istighfar by seeking forgiveness for them and by al-thana by praising them and by visiting them as ziyar so he says the one who cut you off this is what you should do you should Connect with them by salam, by honoring them, by making dua for them, by seeking forgiveness for them, by praising them, and by visiting them. And also, that you should give those who withheld their benefit from you. تعطي من حرمك. That you give those who treated you as an underprivileged. Those who did not give you, you choose to give them, give them from, he says, ta'leem, uh, teaching, al-manfa'a, benefit, and al-mal, and also money. Those who chose not to be kind towards you, those who chose not to give you, he says, you give them. You give them by teaching them, be generous towards them by teaching them, by benefit, benefiting them in general, and by benefiting them financially, to give them money. And, that you pardon those who oppressed you, whether they oppressed you in blood, or wealth, or honor. He said, and you pardon those who oppressed you, whether they oppressed you in terms of blood, and they killed a relative, blood relative, or wealth, money, or honor. They slandered you. They slandered you, they violated your right, your honor, then you forgive them. He said, Some of this is compulsory, and some of this is recommended. Some of this is mustahab. Some of it is recommended and some of it is a must. Some of it is a must. Right? So uh, this is now a collective word, a collective definition for having good manners with others. Uh, the definition, this one, Every time um, we go through this, I keep reminding myself and others that this is what we are supposed to do if we want to be from the people who have good character, those who deal with others with good behavior. This is what we need to do. And we surely know that part of what is being mentioned here, or all of it, <laughs> is really difficult and it takes uh, really uh, someone who is really uh, truly wants Allah and the next life you read Allah wa al akhir those are the ones who will do this because usually when you are cut off then people cut you off well, okay that's fine this is how we usually treat it and also when people choose not to give us if we don't give them that sounds and looks okay that looks all right and also uh, pardoning those who violated our rights, it is very uh, difficult. It is very difficult, but then this is what we need to do in order to fulfill the uh, 
uh, advice of Rasulullah sallallahu Now he says that some of this is a must and some of this is recommended. Yani if uh, your uh, parents, for instance, they did not help you in time of need, for instance, if they are needy, then you have to help them. You have to help them. This is a must. You cannot say, I, I don't want to do that. Right? You have to spend over them. Whereas uh, others who are not directly related, maybe uh, you do not have to spend uh, over them like you have to spend over the close relatives like a father or a son or like that. So some of this is a must. Even if they treated you in, in, a, in, a, in an evil way, you cannot treat them the same. Some of this is a must. And some of this is just uh, recommended. For instance, the one who violated your right in terms of blood. He killed a blood relative, for instance. You have the right, Islamically speaking, either you, uh, if of course the law of the Quran is the law that is being established in the land, then the law says, the Islamic law says, that the relatives, they can choose to uh, have their right, meaning that the, um, the uh, government will establish uh, the death punishment on that person who killed someone else. So the blood relatives, they can choose that the ruler will apply the set punishment of the uh, death penalty, basically. They can also choose to take the blood money instead. That that person who killed him or his people, his blood relatives and like that, they will collect money to pay so that he, they will pay it to the uh, family of the deceased so that they don't have to, that, that person will not be killed basically, the killer will not be killed. They can choose also to pardon and to forgive. And this is what is recommended. This is what is recommended. They have the right to choose the death penalty, the, death penalty, the, the punishment by death. They can choose the money, they can choose to forgive. Forgive completely, not to have him killed, and not to even take the blood money. Right? This is the law, uh, and they can choose. Now, there is in Sahih Muslim that a man came to Rasulullah sallallahu and he brought a man, and that man was tied in a rope, and he was bringing him, pulling that rope, coming to Rasulullah sallallahu and he told him that this person, he killed my brother. So Rasulullah sallallahu looked at the killer, and he said, did you do it? Did you kill him? That man said, if he does not admit, I can prove it. So that man did not deny it. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told him, your family, can they pay for this person and he, to pay the ransom, the blood money? He said, I am too much belittled in my tribe for them to even try to pay on my behalf. So he doesn't have anything. So. Rasulullah sallallahu told him in the end, okay, take him, so that he will be killed. When that man left, Rasulullah sallallahu said, إِنْ قَتَلَهُ فَهُوَ مِثْلُهُ If he killed him, then he is like him. Now the man, after a while, he came back, and he said to Rasulullah sallallahu I heard, because the news reached him, I heard that you said that if I kill him, then I am like him. I only took him by your order. You allowed it. So then Rasulullah sallallahu told him what means, don't you like that your sins and the, sin, the sins of the person that he killed, 
will be put on him. He will be burdened yours and the sins of your brother. So the man said, of course. So he said, then that's it. So then he chose to release him. He chose to release him and to forgive him. Right? And this shows the uh, value and the importance of forgiveness or pardon in Islam. Uh, there are so many ayat and uh, ahadith uh, on this. Uh, one hadith, Rasulullah uh, sallallahu wasallam was asked about the servant. How many times should I pardon my servant? One man asked Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa How many times should I forgive my servant? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered him, that is in one day, he told him 70 times. You should forgive him 70 times in one day. Right? Again, this shows the importance of uh, pardoning and forgiving. Uh, Shaykh al-Islam then he says, as for the great character that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with, then it is the deen that gathers together all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered uh, uh, us. Uh, he said this is what was said by Mujahid and this is the explanation or the interpretation of the Quran as Aisha radiallahu anha said about the Messenger وسلم, that his character was the Quran. Yani in the Quran, Allah says, This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the Messenger, described the Messenger وسلم, that you surely have a great character. So what is this great character that Rasulullah was described with? The Shaykh says it is the deen, the application of the deen in a way that one will be applying all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ordered. This is the great character that Rasulullah sallallahu was described with in the Quran, meaning that he used to apply everything that Allah asked him to do. And this is what actually Aisha radiallahu anha, when she was asked about the character of Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam, she said that. She said that his character was the Quran. Meaning he was, alayhi salatu wasalam, the practical application of what the Quran says to do, to practice. Shaykh al-Islam, he goes on to say, wa the reality of that. The reality of that. The reality of applying all that is in the religion, right? All the orders. The reality of that is al-mubadaratu ila imtithari ma yuhibbu Allah ta'ala bitibi nafsi wa anshirahi sadr. He says, and the reality of that is to rush, to carry out whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves with a good soul and with an open chest. To rush, to apply, to implement what Allah asks what Allah orders you to do with a good soul and with a chest, with an open heart. This is the reality of the great character that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was upon. As for clarifying, he says, as for clarifying that all of this is in the wasir of Allah, and all of this is included in the advice or the counsel that you find in the Quran. Ittaqullah. Surely we have counseled those who were before you and you yourselves to be pious, to have piety. The Shaykh says, this order in the Quran is the same order that Rasulullah or the same advice that Rasulullah gave to Mu'adh ibn Jabal. So now he says, the wasiyah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, fear Allah wherever you are, follow up a good deed, uh, a, good, a evil deed with a good one, and you will erase it, and deal with the people with good character. This is actually the same as the advice in the Quran. How, how is that? He says that the title of taqwa, the word taqwa, it includes doing 
everything that Allah has ordered, whether it is an order that makes it compulsory to do, or an order that is only recommending you to do something. Also, it includes the taqwa, the word taqwa, includes whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. Whether he forbade it, meaning the forbiddance that it is prohibited, or the forbiddance which means that it is disliked to do. And this actually also gathers together the rights of Allah and the rights of the people. The rights of Allah and the rights of the people. The word in the Quran, the advice was to be pious, to have taqwa, to be God-fearing, to be mindful of Allah, to be God-conscious. That is the word in the Quran. But this word, the Shaykh says, this word taqwa includes everything that Allah has ordered, whether that order makes it a must or makes it recommended. And it includes everything that Allah has forbidden, whether that forbiddance was for prohibition or a forbiddance for uh, dislike. He said, but then since taqwa sometimes uh, could mean fearing the punishment, which necessitates staying away from falling into haram, then it has come explained in, in the hadith of Mu'ad. It has came or it has come with explanation in the hadith of Mu'ad. Uh, when you hear the word taqwa, the meaning sometimes that comes to mind is to basically save yourself from the fire by staying away from the uh, haram things, right? This is sometimes how it will be understood. But then taqwa is more comprehensive than that. It means doing all that is ordered and staying away from all that is prohibited. Whether what is ordered was something that is compulsory or even it's not compulsory, it's just recommended. That's part of taqwa. Again, forbiddance, the same thing. Whether that forbiddance was meant to be haram or it was meant to be just disliked. Uh, the Shaykh said that likewise in the hadith of Abi Huayra radiallahu anhuma, that is narrated by a tirmidhi and it is uh, uh, authenticated by him, it says, قِيلَ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ مَا أَكْثَرُ مَا يُدْخِلُ النَّاسَ الْجَنَّةِ قَالَ تَقْوَى اللَّهِ وَحُسْنُ الْخُلُقِ قِيلَ وَمَا أَكْثَرُ مَا يُدْخِلُ النَّاسَ النَّارِ قَالَ الْأَجْوَثَانِ الْفَمُ والفرض. The Shaykh is mentioning another hadith now that also is similar, that has details in it. Uh, he was asked, alayhi salatu wasalam, what is it that causes the people to enter paradise the most? The cause that enters the people paradise the most. He said, taqwa Allah, piety, and husnul khuluq, good character. Then he was asked, and what is it that makes the people enter the fire the most? He said, the two hollow parts of the body, the mouth and the private part, the mouth and the private part. Also, in the authentic hadith from Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, أَكْمَلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِيمَانًا أَحْسَنُهُمْ خُلُقًا the most complete of the believers in terms of Iman are the best in terms of character. The most complete of the believers in terms of Iman, faith, they are the best in terms of having good character. The Sheikh said it is well known that Al-Iman, all of it is Taqwa. Al-Iman, all of it is uh, piety or Taqwa of Allah. Now, he says that given the details of uh, taqwa, its foundations and its branches, this is something that is a, a big subject that um, this place is not suitable for it. Yeah, it's too big for a short advice that he wants to give because a taqwa includes all the religion. But then he said, walakin, but then the spring of goodness 
and its origin, its root, is ikhlas al-abdi li-rabbihi ibadatan wa isti'ana. Is for one to be sincere to his Lord in terms of worship and in, ter in terms of seeking help and assistance. So he said, although he does not have the time to speak about taqwa in detail, but he wants to mention this one point that is part of taqwa that is very important. And then it is being sincere to Allah Azza wa Jal uh, uh, in terms of worship and in terms of seeking help, like what Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala said, Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in, you alone we worship and from you alone we seek help. And in the statement of Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala, Fa'abudhu wa tawakkal alayhi, Surah Hud, Ayah 123, worship him, so worship him and rely upon him, depend upon him. Also, in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Surah Hud, Ayah 88, tawakkaltu wa ilayhi unib. Upon him I rely, and to him I return. And also in the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Ankabut, Ayah 17, فَبْتَغُوا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ الرِّزْقِ وَعْبُدُوهُ وَاشْكُرُوا لَهُ Seek the sustenance, seek the provision from Allah, and worship him, and be thankful to him. He said, in a way, this ikhlas or this sincerity should be done in a way should be so sincere to Allah in a way that he will cut off, that the servant of Allah will cut off his attachment, the attachment of his heart to the created beings. He will cut off the attachment of his heart from the created beings in terms of benefiting from them. This attachment of benefit, he will cut off. In terms of benefiting uh, from them. Or doing things because of them. To be so sincere to Allah Azza wa Jal in a way that your heart is not attached to the human beings. It's actually, this attachment is completely severed between you and the human beings. You don't do things to benefit from them. You don't do things to uh, or for their sake. And he would make his focus, his center of attention, would be his Lord, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is by sticking to calling upon him, bimulazamati dua, by sticking to call upon Allah in every uh, matter that you request whether uh, your uh, request was because of poverty or a need or because you are afraid of something and the likes of that you turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely and you cut off uh, you, the attachment between your heart and the created beings you rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely and you depend upon him completely and you do that sincerely uh, for him and he said and to uh, please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by uh, doing whatever he loves and he said the one who masters this the one who masters ikhlas sincerity between him and Allah the one who masters this he says, it cannot be described. The result, the consequences of sincerity that is complete between you and Allah, he says, he cannot describe the benefit. He cannot describe the result and the consequences that will result from that. So with this, he uh, gave him the advice. Now he will turn to answering the question and that is what is the best good deed after al-fara'id hmm? after al-fara'id of course you cannot before going into that you cannot worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you cannot please him with anything better than what he made compulsory upon you subhanahu wa ta'ala so the first and foremost you want to please allah you worry about the fara'id things that Allah made compulsory upon you, 
you have to do these and you have to carry them out, you have to perfect them. Right? As in the famous hadith, the hadith of Al Wali, the patron of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Bukhari and other books, that Ma taqarraba ilayya abdi bi shay'in ahabba ilayya mimma tarabtu alayhi. My servant wouldn't get closer to me with anything more beloved to me than what I have made compulsory upon him. Then, after fulfilling the fara'id, you do as much as you can of the good deeds. And the more you do of good deeds, the more you become beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as explained in this hadith, which is a famous hadith. Now, this Shaykh Abu Qasim al Baghdadi is uh, really is asking a smart question. There are a lot of good deeds after Al Farai, but then I want to know what is the best of the good deeds. Right? So he's being very direct and asking a very beautiful question. So the answer of the Shaykh, he said, it is different, it varies. It varies according the various people uh, regarding what they are able to do and what suits their times. So it is not possible to give one collective answer that is a detailed answer for everyone because people are different, right? Everyone has a different situation. They have different times. So there isn't one, quite, one answer that will fit all of them. Yani one size fits all. There isn't like a, an answer that is like this. Because people are of various uh, situations. Right? He said, But then, مِمَّا هُوَ كَنْ إِجْمَاعِ بَيْنَ الْعُلَمَاءِ بِاللَّهِ وَأَمْرِهِ He will mention something that is like a unanimous agreement. A unanimous agreement between who? Between the scholars, those who are knowledgeable of Allah and His commands. So there isn't one answer that fits or that is suitable for everybody, but he will mention one thing that the scholars is as if they unanimously agree on it. That Anna Mulazamata that to stick to the remembrance of Allah always is the best thing that one will busy himself with, that the servant of Allah will busy himself with in general. And uh, there are many proofs uh, for this. Uh, he said like the hadith of Abi Hurairah that is narrated by an Imam Muslim in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, سبق المفردون قالوا يا رسول الله ومن المفردون قال الذاكرون الله كثيرا والذاكرات that the مفردون they have outraced the others they beat the others in the race those المفردون then he was asked who are they who are المفردون he said عليه الصلاة والسلام those men and women who remember Allah much. Those, they are the ones who premiered and pioneered others. They, they are in the uh, leadership. They are leading others. The others are all behind them. Who are they? They are the ones who always remember Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether males or females. al mufarridun they are the one Mufarrid is the one who is by himself, right? And some scholars, they said, these are the people who grew old in age and their peers have died. Their peers have died and they stayed behind them. They're still alive and they are remembering Allah a lot. Some scholars, they did say that. But then al Mufarrid is the one who is by himself. The one who is by himself. That's the linguistic meaning. Uh, but then... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi explained it to be those who remember Allah much amongst the males and the females. Also, he said, he mentioned the other authentic hadith in the Sunan of Abi Dawood 
uh, from uh, Abu Darda, upon the authority of Abu Darda from the Prophet وسلم, that he said, Ala unabbi'ukum bi khayri a'malikum wa azkaha inda malikikum wa arfa'iha fi darajatikum wa khayri lakum min i'ata'i al-dhahabi wal-wariq wa min an talqaw aduwakum fatadribu a'naqam wa yadribu a'naqakum qalu bala ya Rasulullah qala dhikrullah In this hadith, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, shall I inform you? Or shall I not inform you? Of the best of your deeds and the most sanctifying or most purifying for you with your Lord, with the King Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also the deed that is going to raise you the most in ranks and degrees with Allah. And it is better, this deed is better than for you to give gold and silver in charity. And it is better for you than to meet your enemy and you chop off their necks, you hit their necks and they hit uh, your necks. So this is a good deed that is better than all of that. It is the best of the deeds, the most purifying in the sight of Allah, most purifying for you in the sight of Allah, the deed that will raise you the most in degrees and ranks with Allah, and it is better for you than to give gold and silver in charity, and it is better for you than to meet your enemy and you chop off their necks and they chop off your necks. They said, sure, they want to know. Bala ya Rasulullah. Rather, yes, they want to know. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam answered, Dhikrullah, the remembrance of Allah. He said, and the proofs from the Quran uh, and from the Iman, al-Dala'il al-Qur'aniyya wal imaniya proofs, evidences from the Quran and Iman, basaran wa khabaran wa nazaran ala dhalika kathira. He said that the proofs that, uh, from that, that we witness and proofs coming from reports and proofs that are based upon reflecting and deriving and reaching conclusions. All of them they gather together to support this and they are many, they are many. All of these proofs they gather together to support the fact that Dhikrullah is the first and foremost. The best of the good deeds Again, after the compulsory ones, after the compulsory deeds, the best good deed is Dhikrullah. He said, وَأَقَلُّ ذلك, The least regarding remembrance of Allah. The least, for one to be from those who remember Allah much. Hmm? The least of that is for one to stick to the adhkar, the dhikr, that is reported from the teacher of goodness and the Imam of the pious Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam He said like the dhikr, the remembrances, the, word, the, remem the words of remembrance that are uh, done during uh, the beginning that should be done uh, the beginning of the day and the end of the day and when one goes to sleep and when one wakes up uh, from his sleep and after or uh, at the end of the uh, Salah and also the words of remembrance that are restricted like what is being said uh, at time of eating and drinking and um, clothing oneself and the time of intercourse also when entering the home and the masjid and the washroom and also when you exit from these and at the time when it rains, the time of thunder, and other than that. He said, وَقَدْ صُنِفَتْ لَهُ الْكُتُبُ الْمُسَمَّى بِعَمَلِ الْيَوْمِ وَالْلَيْلَى That uh, there are books that are authored specifically for this uh, topic, and uh, these uh, books that are called The Actions of the Day and the Night. The Actions of the Day and the Night. He said, then after that, 
for one to stick to a dhikr that is general and open. And the best of that is La ilaha illallah. The best of dhikr is La ilaha illallah. He said, and sometimes there are cases and conditions uh, where the rest of the dhikr, like subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, la hawla wa la quwata illa billah, there are cases where these adhkar would be better than to say la ilaha illallah, but the best of dhikr in general is to say la ilaha illallah, and sometimes other dhikr will be more uh, suitable or more beneficial uh, in certain times and cases or situations. Then he goes on to say, then you should know, then you should know that everything that the tongue says, that the tongue utters, and the heart imagines anything that the heart or everything that the heart utters or the heart imagines that brings one closer to Allah, whether it is going to be teaching, uh, learning knowledge or teaching it, commanding what is good or forbidding what is evil, all of that is from the dhikr of Allah. This is part of dhikr of Allah. So uh, the best could be after al faraid is dhikr Allah. And one should be using the adhkar that was reported from the Messenger وسلم, in general, when you wake up, when you go to sleep, after salah, morning and evening, and also after that, dhikrullah in general. He said part of the dhikr also, you should understand that part of the dhikr is anything you say or anything your heart imagines or thinks of that will bring you closer to Allah, whether it was learning, seeking knowledge, or teaching it, commanding good or forbidding evil, all of that is part of dhikrullah. He says, and this is why the one who gets busy by seeking knowledge, the beneficial knowledge, after doing the compulsory uh, deeds, or one who sits in a sitting where he is understanding, he's trying to understand or learning, or he is teaching, or he is teaching the knowledge or the jurisprudence, al-fiqh, Al-fiqh al-ladhi sammahu Allah wa rasooluhu fiqh The understanding of the religion that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger called it fiqh. Then this also is from the best of uh, types of remembering Allah azza wa jal. And based on this, if you reflect, if you reflect and ponder, you will not find between the early scholars regarding the words that were reported from them about the best of the good deeds, you will not find a lot of differing. You will not find a lot of differing, right? So uh, the best of the good deeds is the dhikr. But then the word dhikr is a comprehensive word that includes anything that will bring you closer to Allah, uh, Azza wa Jal. Right? So therefore, uh, sittings of knowledge, when you sit in the sittings of knowledge, to learn or to teach, this is part of remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He goes on to say, and وَمَشْتَبَهَ أَمْرُهُ عَلَى الْعَبْدِ If the servant of Allah, he gets confused regarding a certain matter, whether it is best to do this or not, to get enrolled in this or not. Because sometimes it happens. They ask you to participate in a certain thing, Islamic activity in the mosque, or uh, helping regarding something. You don't know whether you should get involved or you busy yourself with something else, right? So whether you attend a class or you're going to help in recording and like this, right? So you have the choice, either do this or, or do that. You are going to teach the kids the Quran or to help them with some program, 
or you yourself going and attending a lecture somewhere else. You don't know which one is better for you, right? He says if you are confused regarding what is best for you to do this or to do that, then فَعَلَيْهِ بِالْإِسْتِخَارَةِ الْمَشْرُوعَةِ Then what he is recommending for you is to do istikhara, that is legislating. To pray salatul istikhara, to pray salatul istikhara, the two rak'at, and then the dua after that. To ask Allah Azza wa Jal to basically help you to make the best choice or to select for you the best uh, choice. Uh, he said for uh, the one who prays istikhara, the one who asks for the choice from Allah, he will never regret. He will never regret. He said, and let him do a lot of that, a lot of istikhara, uh, and also that let him do a lot of dua, ask Allah Azza wa a lot, for dua is the key to every goodness. And let him not rush and say, I called, I supplicated, but then Allah did not answer me. And let him choose and select the best of the times to make dua, that is, like the last part of the night, and like the end of the salawat, and at the time of adhan, and the time when it's raining, and the likes of that, and the likes of that. So this was the answer to this question. What is the best of the good deeds after the compulsory ones? The answer is Dhikrullah uh, Azza wa Jal. And this is after he explained that uh, the situations of every uh, people is different, but then something that is like a unanimous agreement between the scholar, between the scholars of Islam, that the best good deed after the compulsory uh, deeds is to stick to remembering Allah Azza wa Jal. And this is by doing the dhikr that is reported from Rasulullah throughout the day and after salah and like that, then to stick to the dhikr in general, the best of it is la ilaha illallah, then sometimes other types of dhikr are better or more suited to the situation, then he should understand that whatever you say or whatever you imagine in your heart that brings you closer to Allah, whether it was teaching or learning or commanding good or forbidding evil, this is part of the remembrance of Allah uh, Azza uh, wa Jal. And if you get confused about two good deeds, which one of them is more, uh, is better for you to, to do, then you pray Salatul Istikhara and you ask Allah Azza wa Jal uh, a lot of dua uh, to help you to make the best uh, selection. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, going to stop here. So uh, the last uh, or the other question was two questions that were left. Inshallah, we will finish them uh, next week. Uh, inshallah, Taala. Then we will start uh, the new book. I tried to look for the book. Uh, uh, Habib doesn't have it, unfortunately, they are sold out. So we'll see if someone else uh, can get us that for those who are interested in, in that book. Uh, but then, really, as I said, again, you don't really need it. Uh, but if you do, then I have a copy if you want to photocopy some pages of it or copy all of it. It's, it's up to you, inshallah. Uh, but for now, we'll stop here and um, we'll continue next week. Next week, the answer to the two questions. What are the best jobs? What is the best means of seeking a living? Right? And the question about knowledge and uh, the best book uh, that one should study in every uh, branch of the legal uh, knowledge, uh, inshallah. Uh, with this, we come to the end of this uh, session. Um, I'm not sure if there are any questions.
brother is asking about the uh, dhikr, if we can shed more light on it, as there are many groups and uh, some uh, Sufi orders that they have their own. Uh, what the Sheikh mentioned is the dhikr that is reported from the teacher of good and the imam of the pious, and that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So whatever he used to do, this is what is meant by the dhikr. And uh, basically, whatever is reported from him, if the people stick to that, uh, their lives will finish, and they will not finish that, right? Uh, so so this, is, uh, this is the case. Now, some people, they do dhikr in a certain way uh, that was not reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like dhikr together, right? Uh, or uh, they would, um, for instance, have a circle and they will uh, dance and stand up and sit down, or they will use words of remembrance that were not reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at all, like for instance, the dhikr that is done with the single word Allah. They will say Allah, 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 and they go on like that. There is no dhikr that is reported from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And this thing actually, actually does not mean anything. Even the Arabic language does not allow for it. I mean, you have subhanallah, glory be to Allah, or Allah is far removed from any deficiency. Allah Akbar, Allah is the great or the greatest, right? The grand, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah. Like it's a complete sentence. But then Allah, Allah, Allah يعني, has no meaning. And even some of the scholars, they said about this, that if you come to someone, let's say he's a, a minister or a king or something, and you, let's say his name is Fulan, right? And you want to basically praise him, or try to get what you want. So you want to praise him in a good way. So you keep mentioning his name. Fulan, 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 Fulan. And you keep repeating it like he's waiting. What do you want? Right? Where is the second part of the sentence? Right? Worse than that is they dropped Allah and it became a pronoun. And that is huwa. Right? So it becomes who, who, who. Who, and then they continue like this till the one who's listening he doesn't even know what they're saying because it's like sounds like a dog barking really that's how it sounds because when they get into it I don't know if you have seen maybe some of you have seen that right so this has nothing to do with dhikr and we are certain that Rasulullah never remembered Allah or mentioned Allah in this fashion right so every people, they have their own way. Uh, but then, uh, the Muslims, they have only one book, that is the Quran. They have only one messenger, and that is Muhammad wasallam. So they will follow the way of the messenger uh, wasallam. And uh, many times I say to people who differ about some forms of dhikr, uh, say let's let's use what we are sure that it was reported from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After we finish all of that, then we will look into this other thing that you are mentioning. Right? Uh, it's very unfortunate that many people they will leave what is agreed upon and they will stick to something that the least that can be said about it, it's not reported and we don't know where it came from. Right. Uh, and this shows that these people are so much after their desires. They are so much immersed in tiba uh, al-hawa or following their desires. And uh, this is a very sad situation. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is the one who is able to take them out from their misguidance uh, for them to see the light and to be uh, guided. So the dhikr. Uh, is found in the uh, famous books uh, that the scholars have authored. Uh, 
uh, past and, and present. And uh, amongst these, uh, the book that Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah himself uh, wrote called Al Kalim al Tayyib, uh, the good words, or the one that his student Ibn al Qayyim authored called Al Wadr al Sayyib. It has at the end of it, it has the dhikr that is reported from the Messenger. There are other scholars that authored books uh, like Amal al Yawm al by Imam al Nasa'i, and also the famous book Al Adhkar by Al Imam al Nawawi. Uh, so, uh, and then there are books that are even earlier than this, the books of the Sunnah uh, themselves, they have a lot of that. If you look in Bukhari, Muslim, and uh, the four Sunan, those major six books, they have a lot of dhikr that you can uh, find in there that they will report that Rasulullah was doing this or was saying it or he recommended it alayhi salatu was salam. Uh, I should say that uh, uh, the work of an Imam Ibn al-Qayyim al -Qayyim, Ibn al -Sayyid, is very interesting and, and towards the end of it before starting to mention the Adhkar he mentioned that the best form of dhikr is the recitation of the Quran that is because uh, the words of Allah cannot be matched the best of dhikr is reciting the Quran right? after that then comes the uh, dhikr the best form of dhikr is uh, the dhikr that is called uh, dhikr mudaf the dhikr that is multiplied in terms of reward right? and you have dhikr that is combined and dhikr that is multiplied you have dhikr that is single, like subhanallah and alhamdulillah. You have dhikr that is combined, like subhanallah wa bihamdi. Right? Subhanallah wa bihamdi, this is combined. It's better than subhanallah alone or alhamdulillah alone. Right? Uh, then you have the dhikr that is multiplied in reward, like the dhikr subhanallah wa bihamdi, ala da khalqi. And this is combined and multiplied in reward. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, adada khalqi, the number of his creation. Subhanallah wa bihamdi, rida nafsi, as much as he is pleased. And subhanallah wa bihamdi, zina ta'arshi, the weight of his throne. And subhanallah wa bihamdi, midada kalimati, the ink for writing his words. Right? So this is dhikr that is both combined and multiplied. Uh, then you have the hadith which says afdal al-dhikr la ilaha illallah wa afdal al-dua alhamdulillah the best of dhikr is la ilaha illallah the best of dhikr is la ilaha illallah that is kalimat al-tawheed that is the best form of uh, al-dhikr after that comes words that are from the Quran subhanallah walhamdulillah Allahu akbar Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. And this is Rasulullah Sallallahu said about them that they are the best dhikr and they are from the Quran. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Right? So this is also uh, from the dhikr that is uh, recommended. Now, dhikr in general is better than dua. Dua is dhikr too. Dua is also dhikr. Right? So the dua is less than a dhikr, right? So you have recitation of the Qur'an is the best. After that, the combined and multiplied dhikr. And after that, la ilaha illallah. Then subhanallah, alhamdulillah, wallahu akbar. Then after that comes a dua. That is why in the hadith, Afdal al-dua, alhamdulillah. The hadith says, the best of dhikr is la ilaha illallah. And the best of dua is alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah. Where is the dua in alhamdulillah? Where is the dua? Alhamdulillah. Can anyone answer? Alhamdulillah. All praise is due to Allah. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says about it that it is the best dua. But this is dhikr. Is it really dua? It is dhikr. Right? The scholars say about it that because this dua, alhamdulillah, is basically you are praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you praise Allah, this is being thankful to Him. And Allah says, لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ If you are thankful, then I will increase, increase my favors upon you. So by praising Allah, you are actually making dua of Him. And you should expect much more, much more than what you ask. Right? Because of, if, you, if you praise Allah and you are thankful to Him, Allah will be uh, so generous towards you. That is why when you say Alhamdulillah, then that is the best form of dua. And it is the sunnah. It is recommended to start your dua by praising Allah. When salat as salam ala nabi sallam and so on and so forth. So this is part of the dhikr. You have also as salat as salam ala nabi sallam. That is one of the best forms of dhikr. You have also an istighfar. Yani, Salah ala nabi it's a dhikr and dua also. And al istighfar also seeking forgiveness, astaghfirullah, is one of the uh, best forms of uh, dua. One of the best forms of dhikr also is the word la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There, is, there will be no change and no power to do any change except through the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You wanted to ask? You changed your mind, or this is another question? <laughs> I'm flipping for sure. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. The Hassan, or this is Hassan, sorry, Hassan Hadith in uh, yes. Sahih al Jami, or I forget, Timothy or something. Mm -hmm. The dua for entering the market is not saying, Yes. Dua, right? If yes. you say that, one, the Hadith says, one million good deeds are written for you, one million bad deeds are wiped away. If we remember to say it, whenever we have a need to go to the marketplace and we say it and we don't miss it, and if Allah gives us the favor of remembering to say that, when we go for a need, that will be a blessing, right? As for going to the marketplace just to say that in order to get it, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant you what, what you ask for, uh, inshallah. So, Basically, uh, that is a great hadith. Yeah. That, has, uh, that hadith uh, mentions a lot of a lot of reward for for this dhikr.